Hey guys and welcome to today's video where we are going to be talking about the gradual death of consumerism in the makeup industry and the beauty community here on YouTube. And by this I mean the evolution over the last few years from people feeling the need to buy hundreds of makeup products in order to keep up with the latest trends to now consumers being a lot more selective with what they do buy, how much they spend and how much makeup they keep in their collections. So before we start, make sure you are subscribed and notifications on and don't forget to leave a like on this video if you do go on to enjoy it. Okay, so first off, let's just establish what consumerism is and how it translates into the beauty community. So consumerism can be defined in two ways. It can either be the protection and the promotion of the interests of a consumer or as the preoccupation of society with the acquisition of material and consumer goods. So the first is the more traditional use of the word. It speaks more from a brand perspective. Uh, consumerism is what a brand is doing in order to protect the interests of their customers. But this video is more concerned with the latter, which is a more modern description, usually negatively associated with the overbuying of products because society teaches us that more is better. And it's quite closely linked with the concept of materialism and valuing having a lot of material goods in our possession. The reason I've decided to specifically look at this concept in the beauty industry is because I feel like in the last 10 years or so, the makeup industry is where we've seen one of the most drastic changes in consumer as a result of the internet and a beauty community online. The value of the cosmetics industry has tripled between 2000 and 2019 on account of the hike in spending on makeup and cosmetic products resulting from technology and the internet allowing for the faster creation of higher quality products, the promotion of products to a younger audience and the popularity of beauty and makeup content on platforms like YouTube and Instagram. And beauty content was one of the first genres to appear on YouTube with the likes of Tanya Burr, Zoella, Michelle Phan, Marlene Estelle, Blair Fowler and Candy Johnson all creating makeup and beauty content such as lookbooks, makeup tutorials, get ready with me's and product reviews and growing their channels into the hundreds and thousands and millions of followers by the early 2010s. And their videos would mostly appeal to teenage girls between kind of the ages of 11 and 17. And a lot of the time the content gave off a kind of big sister vibe as if the person in the video was teaching you how to do your makeup well for your benefit rather than for theirs. And this content did not feed into consumerism really because at this point, the kind of 2009 to 2013, these beauty creators were not earning the same level of money and reputation that YouTube started to pay after this point. So a lot of their content used the same products to create different looks. The focus wasn't really on what products they were using, it was more on how they were using them to get to the end look. However, once YouTube started to pay well and become more popular as a platform, generating bigger audiences and higher view counts, beauty content started to evolve. These YouTubers had more money to spend on their videos and therefore they could afford to make videos renewing all the new products that were coming out in order to keep generating a lot of views because people wanted to know what these new products were like and they were kept interested because these YouTubers were all using different products in their videos. And favourites videos also became a big hit and they required the creator to have like a whole new bunch of products every month that they could put in this favourite video. They would recommend these products that they loved to their subscribers so they would have to try you know a whole load of new products every single month in order to generate a collection of their favourites which they could then showcase to their subscribers and because of the increase in these types of videos which required creators to buy products you know the reviews and the favourites quickly these creators built up huge makeup collections often having like an entire room in their house dedicated to both filming and storing all of this makeup and those massive collections served no purpose because i guarantee that most of the products in those drawers had only been used once and then forgotten about because they got pushed to the bottom of the drawer by all of the new products that they were buying and they just weren't good enough for that creator to dig through the drawers to look for it and also they probably forgot that it was even there because of the amount of new stuff that was coming into the drawers there's just no way that you can keep up with and remember every product that's in there. So you're inevitably just going to end up using the same few staples most of the time and occasionally mix it up with something from one of the drawers. However, even though these products were only used sparingly, video tours of these massive makeup collections were pretty much guaranteed to receive a million views or more because audiences just loved seeing these huge makeup collections that these beauty gurus had built up. 
These collection videos would usually feature pretty much the same setups with white chests of drawers to store bigger items like eyeshadow palettes, a white dressing table, and then some clear organizers on top, usually for products like lipsticks or nail polishes that were small enough that they could fit into like the little individual drawers. And even the products that these people owned would generally be the same because beauty gurus would get sent the same PR packages from brands and any products from those packages that they decided to keep would end up in those drawers. I do wonder if to some extent people were buying or keeping makeup that they knew they weren't going to use or that they didn't really like purely for the purpose of filling up these drawers to make these videos more aesthetic because every drawer is perfectly organized and perfectly full and I wonder this because like I said there's no real need to have this much makeup but the more extravagant you could make your thumbnail via the amount of makeup that was in it the more views you would get and i think at this point creators feared that their audiences would not be interested in their content if they weren't testing new products the era of like simple makeup tutorials was kind of over no one was searching for that anymore so there was now pressure to be showing something new in every single video uh, in order to keep the audience interested you know, no one wants to see you use the same palette a hundred times because the content becomes repetitive and boring. Instead, people who wanted to show multiple looks would tend to do that in one video. So for example, like a 15 looks using the ABH Renaissance palette would be a video title that you might see or something along those lines instead of making that video 15 times and doing different looks in each one. So there weren't really any conversations going on at this point about sustainability or overconsumption because people enjoyed this content. People wanted to see these massive makeup collections. So obviously they weren't engaging in conversations that would discourage people from collecting makeup. And I don't know if it was just that no one was really thinking about the environmental impact that buying this amount of makeup was having or whether people just ignored that fact because the content was entertaining and pretty much all beauty content at that time revolved around new products and PR unboxings and product reviews. So it seemed kind of counterintuitive to encourage people to not buy anything new. There weren't any beauty gurus who were pushing the narrative of only buying what you need because I guess they just didn't feel like their content would be able to compete with the other beauty content that was coming out if they weren't engaging in these product reviews or these PR unboxings that involved them having to have loads of new products on hand all the time. That stupid doorbell. Every single video, someone comes through the door. <laughs> I don't know why. It's just like, as soon as I put the camera on, it's like, okay, everyone come to my house. So these videos overall drove consumerism of makeup to a new high because viewers would see these huge makeup collections with every product you could ever want in every single color. And they would both admire and envy the person who had all of this makeup because as a viewer, you would love to have all of these products on hand whenever you wanted them but buying excessive amounts of makeup is not a viable financial investment to make if you a don't earn as much money as these youtubers and b don't use makeup as a job you know there's nothing wrong with buying lots of makeup if that's something that you enjoy and you actually use it all but buying the excessive amounts of makeup that these people had would not be something that an ordinary person would necessarily do because that is a lot of money's worth of makeup in those rooms. I think the thought process behind makeup consumerism is that kind of feeling of needing something. You see all of your favorite YouTubers using a product and talking about how great it is. So you then start to think that you need that product as well. And that having that product will make you happy. It will make you good at makeup and it will make you look and feel great. The problem is that makeup trends move so fast and new products come out all the time so you'd buy this amazing product that everyone's talking about but then the next week they're all talking about something different and raving about another amazing product that everyone should have and instead of encouraging steady investment into high quality usable makeup that you are going to repetitively use these videos showing off huge collections of makeup and constantly reviewing new makeup made you feel like you needed to have a ton of makeup in order to keep up with trends when actually that's simply not the case. I genuinely believe that the best makeup artists are the ones who can still create a stunning look whilst working with a limited range of products. It's the same with fashion. You know, I would admire more the person who spends £50 a month on clothes and always looks amazing versus the person who spends £5,000 a month on clothes just to keep up with every single new trend and always be wearing a new outfit. You know, I feel like the people who have the best style are the ones who can work with whatever they're given. So having tons and tons of makeup doesn't necessarily make you a better makeup artist, it just means that you have more options. With these videos showing all of this makeup that these beauty gurus who had amassed during their careers, 
made you feel like having all that stuff was how to become better at makeup and be like them because obviously they've become better at makeup throughout their careers so seeing everything that they've amassed is kind of like oh well maybe that's why they got good at makeup because they had so much makeup to hand and these videos also just like completely brushed over the concept of makeup expiration and the fact that makeup doesn't last forever and looking back i think these beauty gurus probably purposefully kept makeup that they knew was expired in order to keep their drawers full and make them look impressive for these makeup collection tours but as a viewer at the time you didn't think about that you just saw this amazing makeup collection and envied the person who had it because you wished that you could justify having that much makeup I think the concept of consumerism being driven by envy for what the beauty gurus had was also massively driven by PR. You know, people would see the amount of PR that beauty gurus received and be jealous and envied the large collections that their favorite YouTubers had built up from receiving so many free products. You know, brands by the mid 2010s had caught on to the fact that beauty gurus pushing new products was making those products sell. And so they started to send extremely lavish, over the top PR packages to beauty gurus in the hopes that they might open the package on camera and show the products to their audience. You know, some of these PR packages were absolutely ridiculous. Like the giant beauty blender that Beauty Blender sent to a ton of YouTubers to premiere their new foundation. Like there was absolutely no need to send this like human sized egg to people's houses, but because it was so over the top and ridiculous, a lot of people would make videos unboxing it. I mean, they also made videos about it because the foundation shade range was absolutely dire and therefore it became trendy to make a video criticizing them, but we're gonna skip past that for this video because that's not relevant. And I remember being absolutely obsessed with Tati Westbrook's PR unboxing videos where she'd stack all of her packages up and then open them one by one with her husband. Like whenever I watched one of those videos, I was so jealous because she was getting all of this free stuff and I wanted to get all of this free stuff, but I wasn't a beauty guru. And these unboxing videos would rack up hundreds of thousands of views and over time they just getting kept getting more and more extreme like people now are still making these videos and they have piles of boxes that are like double the size of them like how did you make all those boxes stack up and not fall over for that thumbnail like it just it's wild to me how much PR people will save up just to do a massive unboxing video. The amount of stuff that would be unboxed and shown off in these videos just furthered the viewer's desire to buy more makeup because the PR videos were kind of an extension of the review videos that we talked about earlier, but they were more extreme because instead of reviewing one product or one collection, there would be hundreds of products mentioned in one video. That, albeit they wouldn't be tested in as much detail, but people would often like swatch something and then give their opinion on whether it was a good consistency or a good shade or whatever. Particularly with eyeshadows, people would tend to swatch the eyeshadow palettes in their unboxing videos. And these PR packages were pretty much the main reason why beauty gurus were able to amass so much makeup because brands were just constantly sending them free stuff. And I recently watched Trixie Mattel decluttering her makeup collection and she said in that video that she felt bad throwing away makeup that had been sent to her for free. And it kind of seems like people, when they get sent PR, don't want to waste things, but once they've opened it and swatched it, they can't then really give the products away to their audience. They can give them to family and friends and potentially to women shelters, but once something's been opened and used, it's kind of less likely that charities or you know just the general public will want to take that product off their hands and the products then ends up just sitting in their collections for a while they might swatch it and be like oh that's nice so i'll keep that and i might use it and then they just forget about it because there's so much other stuff that they have and then when they come to declutter they don't want to throw it away because it's barely used and it was sent to them for free so it just feels like a waste that you even had it in the first place and some people, like I know Tati was one of them, I can't remember who else, I think Trixie also does this, would give away a lot of their PR products to view either viewers if they were unopened or to family and friends or women's shelters if they were opened. Um, so not everything went to waste, but the amount of PR that people were being sent, like trying to sort through all of those products to figure out what could go where must have been an absolute logistical nightmare. So I think a lot of people did just kind of keep whatever was in their shade and give away whatever wasn't. And then they would just sort it out later on when it came to declutter the collections that they had. And it's also worth noting that these huge makeup collections could be written off as a business expense if they were used in a video. Whatever these beauty gurus bought to use for videos could be written off of their tax bills. They wouldn't have to pay tax on that because they'd used it for content, which 
you know, it's always nice to get a tax deduction. And I don't know how tax works for PR. I know you get charged tax on gifts, but I don't know if showing them in a video excludes you from this. You know, someone with more tax knowledge than me might be able to answer that, but I'm not 100% sure, especially when it's they haven't actually asked for it. It's just been sent to them. I don't know how that works. And in the same vein of brands pushing consumerism and overbuying through PR, I do briefly want to mention Morphe because Morphe was a front runner when it came to this. Because Morphe would make those £35 palettes, you know, give every beauty guru under the sun a 10% off code, which basically guaranteed that the beauty guru would give Morphe products a good review in their videos so that they could persuade their fans to buy the products and use their affiliate code to make them money. And the problem with what Morphe was doing was that it wasn't just super shady, but they also just kept making the same, basically the same palette over and over again because the beauty gurus would keep shilling Morphe products, their audience members would keep falling for it and continually buy these huge palettes full of basically the same shades that they already had or shades that they would probably never use because the shades were so similar in the palette that it could easily be cut down to nine instead of 35. Like Morphe as a brand was also very accessible. They were quite cheap and even though the products weren't revolutionary in the way that some beauty gurus pushed them to be, they did the job. And personally, I have a few Morphe palettes that I still use and enjoy. Uh, and the Morphe era on YouTube was definitely big for consumerism because when the products are at an accessible price, it's more likely that people will buy them based off of a couple of good reviews because it doesn't seem like as big of an investment as, for example, buying a Natasha Denona palette. However, once you've bought three Morphe palettes at $20 each, you've now got 105 shades and likely 80 of them you will never use because they're all variations of the same tone of brown and the other 25 are the colours that differentiate each palette. You know, there's no need for anyone to have that many similar shades, but the beauty gurus made it feel like you needed to have like the 35O and the 35OS and the 35O2 and that it was going to be, they were all going to be so different to each other that people were duped into buying stuff that they just didn't need. And Morphe also bought into the idea of limited edition products when they launched the Jaclyn Hill palette in 2017. And limited edition products were a big pusher of consumerism for two reasons. So firstly, there was FOMO. You know, there was the worry that if you didn't invest in this product now, that you never could. So people would impulsively buy limited edition products for fear that they would miss out if they decided that they wanted them later on. A Mac were a big culprit of this. They would release a limited edition collection at least every Christmas, but at one point they were doing them like four to five times a year, where the products themselves wouldn't be anything special, like a lot of the products would be available in other forms but it was the beautiful packaging that the limited edition products would come in that would persuade people to buy them every single time. And I am guilty of this. I bought this highlighter and blush duo from MAC in Christmas 2017, which honestly, it's gross that I still have this, but I do still use it. And I absolutely love the blusher in this. Like it's, it's worn and it's absolutely uh, really disgusting, but this is the blush shade and I love it and I just can't part with it um, and it was definitely worth the £30 that I paid for it but I was like 15 spending my Christmas money on a product that at that time I wouldn't even use half of it because I did not care for blusher I just wanted a highlighter so I basically paid £30 for a highlighter when I was 15 years old because I felt like it was a justified purchase because it was limited edition and I wouldn't be able to go back and buy it later if I changed my mind and this is definitely expired uh, and I, it's kind of gross that I still use it. I love how I'm laughing about this as, a, as if I didn't give myself an eye infection last week from using an expired mascara, but we're just gonna push over that because this hasn't given me any problems yet. Secondly, limited edition products encourage you to overconsume because there's a sort of pride in having something that no one else has. Like, if anyone watching this video has that specific blush and highlighter duo, I would be quite surprised because, I mean, I have quite a small audience and it's a little bit of a niche product. And that almost gives me like a smug feeling of having something that no one else can get their hands on. And that's also why I can't throw it away because I know that I can't replace it. And this isn't, there isn't really any value in having limited edition makeup in the same way as things like limited edition shoes, which, you know, you can resell that at a higher price in the future because it will have been dead stock for a long time. Whereas 
makeup, you can't resell makeup at a higher price because it won't grow in value over time because it will just expire. And why would anyone want to buy a limited edition product that they know expired like two years ago? So you don't have the same smugness of knowing that this asset that you've got is going to become more valuable over time. It's more the principle of having this product that no one else can buy that makes it feel more um, luxurious and exclusive. So back to the Morphe Jaclyn Hill palette though, and this product definitely exploited the feelings of urgency and desire that labelling a product as limited edition generated, because the original launch of the palette stated that it was going to be limited edition, but five years later it's still on sale, and I reckon that it's probably Morphe's most successful palette apart from maybe the James Charles one. And when it first came out, there was definitely a rush for it. And it is a great palette. Like I have that palette and I have one of the original Formula Ones and I still use it now again with the using expired makeup, but don't judge me, okay? <laughs> but labeling it as limited edition is what made hundreds of people run out to buy it on the first launch, you know, sitting on the Morphe website for an hour before the launch date because they were hoping that they were gonna be able to get their hands on one of these exclusive products before they sold out. And it was quite manipulative of them to do this, but also kind of genius because a ton of people who usually probably would have waited to see all the reviews and see what people are saying before buying it went and bought it straight away because they felt like they needed to, otherwise they were gonna miss out. And this perfectly demonstrates how this kind of phase between probably 2015 to 2018 of limited edition products really fed into consumerism in the makeup industry. And another big pusher was collector mindsets. You know, this was a big thing in the mid to late 2010s. Some of the most collectible products were the ones that either came from brands that only launched small amounts of product and therefore their products felt exclusive. So having like the full collection uh, felt amazing. All from brands that focused on packaging and concepts, which made all of their products fit together. So you wanted to have the whole collection. And there are four brands that specifically come to mind when I think of this, which is Kylie Cosmetics, Jeffree Star Cosmetics, Too Faced, and Urban Decay. I feel like the first instance of a makeup brand playing on the idea of collectors was Urban Decay with their Naked palettes. The original Naked palette was such a huge hit that it was difficult to get your hands on it when it was in its prime. So when Urban Decay launched the Naked 2, the Naked 3, and everything that came after it, people were rushing out to buy it so that they could have the complete Naked collection. And the first three palettes, I felt like they fit together well. They gave you a warm toned, a cool toned, and a rose gold toned palette each. So you had kind of all the possible neutrals that you could want. So that kind of made sense because they weren't repetitions of each other. But in recent years, Urban Decay have driven the Naked name into the ground, trying to continue riding on the original Naked's coattails, likely because they believed that people would want to complete their Naked collection and they'd be more likely to buy the palettes that had the Naked name on them because of this collector mindset. Like, the recent palettes have nothing to do with the original Naked palettes and they don't look like they should be called Naked palettes, you know, they're not neutrals, but Urban Decay still labels them as Naked palettes for this reason. And Too Faced were also a big one, the chocolate bar palette and the Christmas collections in particular, you know, people went wild for the chocolate bar palettes because they smelled like chocolate and the original one did well. So then they came out with more, they came out with sweet peach and the white chocolate and their Christmas collections would always have lavish packaging. So people wanted to collect them for that. And side note, can we all please acknowledge now that these chocolate bar palettes are not cute. Like the original one was fine, but the other ones that came after it, this white chocolate one in particular, was so ugly. <laughs> like if you have one of these palettes, let me know how these shades fit together because there just seems to be like they've thrown random shades in there. So they've got all the neutrals and then they've got like a green that doesn't fit with any of the other colors or they've got like a purple and it's like, why are you here? You don't fit. I always just struggle to see why people raved so much over these kind of very generic and in my opinion, terrible colour stories of these palettes that really their only gimmick was that they smelt nice. And Too Faced were another culprit though, like Morphe, of releasing a ton of palettes that all basically had the same neutral browns and only a couple of interesting shades, but instead of paying beauty gurus to push them, Too Faced relied on people wanting to collect the whole chocolate bar set. And Kylie Cosmetics is slightly different to these because when it first launched, it only had three products which sold out instantly. So 
The collector mindset came from the limited product range and the exclusivity of it, rather than the products all following the same gimmick. And I think because there was so much hype around the Kylie lip kits, people wanted to collect every single shade as kind of like a status thing, like look at me, I've got every single one of these super exclusive lipsticks that sell out every time they're restocked. And it, you know, it felt good to get your hands on something that people really wanted. And there's also the fact that obviously Kylie's name was on them, so people who were super fans of her obviously wanted everything that she put out because at that time she didn't have many other products with her name on so people just went absolutely crazy for these lipsticks like even the ugly unwearable shades sold out straight away like Skyly, love the name but who on god's green earth is wearing this lipstick even though it's a completely unwearable shade people still went like rushed to buy it because they wanted the whole collection i remember seeing photos on instagram of people who had the whole collection and all the comments was like oh my god i wish i could have that and it's like do you need two blue lipsticks because i certainly don't and i don't envy the person who spent 40 dollars on that and i also think with lipsticks they would often be kept in those plastic organizers on top of a beauty guru's desk and they'd often be in the back of people's videos so they wanted to get the whole set from one brand so that the lipsticks in the organizer would like look neat and aesthetically pleasing and one such brand that i know quite a few people had the full collection of in the back of their videos was jeffree star cosmetics and i don't know why jeffree star's lipsticks were such a collectible thing i don't know if it's because they were in the bright pink packaging so they kind of gave a pop of color to the white background and i don't know if it's because the lipsticks came in every color of the rainbow so it was cute to have them all but there were certainly a few beauty gurus and actually non-beauty gurus as well who had their jeffree star collection in their video background and another item that they did was the mirrors i've seen a few people who've like been in the comments of his tweets being like look at all my mirrors and they've got like every single one so he's definitely played on the idea of cre creating like a collector's item and then just releasing one of it with every single one of his collections now, we've talked a lot about how consumerism was rife in the beauty industry in the mid to late 2010s, but personally, I feel like consumerism in makeup, at least in the online community, has started to die a slow death. And there are kind of, I think, two reasons for this. So the first reason is that sustainability has just become much more of a concern in recent years and consumers are becoming more aware of the environmental impact of what they spend their money on, especially when it comes to material items like clothes and makeup. And makeup and fashion are similar in that both industries cycle through trends often so as to keep you buying new things. And one difference between them is that makeup has an expiry date regardless of what is trendy, whereas well-made clothes can be kept for as long as the owner wants to keep them for, whereas things that come from like Shein, they are designed to only last for as long as the trend does. So I guess in that way, clothes from brands like Shein do expire in a way, but makeup, you know, everything will expire. Whereas with clothes, if you are more careful with what you buy and you make sure you buy well-made clothes, those clothes will probably last you for as long as you want them to. However, makeup can be repurposed. You know, if you buy a black lipstick for Halloween, a lot of liquid lipsticks nowadays are also made to be eye safe. So you could use that lipstick as an eyeliner. And the same thing with things like bronzer and blush, you know, they could be used on your eyes or more lightly slash heavily or in a different shape, depending on what the current trend is. It's very, very rare to see a new product completely come out in makeup because makeup has been around for so long that pretty much everything that you'd want to put on your face is already out there and this means that you know if you're willing to you can make your makeup last a long time because the same blush or bronzer can be used regardless of what the trend is for how you wear it there isn't really a need to have a huge collection of makeup because all you need is the basics and then maybe one neutral and one colorful eyeshadow if that's your vibe of course this makeup will need to be replaced eventually but the point is that people have realized now that you don't need a huge collection of makeup in order to do your makeup well. The trend that I think has had the most effect on how people have viewed consumerism in the makeup industry is the idea of being like clean and the clean girl aesthetic on TikTok. The clean girl aesthetic is a very kind of ethereal concept where people have clear skin, they wear very little makeup, they keep their hair slicked down and neat and yet they look great, they don't look like an egg like I do when I try and do that. And everything they own is in a shade of like white, grey or brown and their rooms are generally very tidy and clean. This obviously does not coincide well with having 150 different eyeshadow palettes that you never use. So as a result of people trying to become this like clean girl, we've started to see a lot less of people buying excessive amounts of makeup 
and more of people buying small amounts of makeup products that they actually use. Like, don't get me wrong, cosmetics is still a massive industry and beauty YouTube still involves reviews and hauls, but these videos are becoming less popular in favour of the videos over on TikTok of people living like clean, minimalistic lifestyles. However, the clean girl aesthetic, while on the surface it appears to have kind of provided a roadblock to makeup consumerism, it's actually just moved that consumerism into skincare. We are seeing people buying excessive amounts of skincare and then showing off their perfectly clear, evenly toned skin, which is then in turn encouraging viewers to go out and buy tons of skincare products that they will probably use once and then never use again because they didn't get the same results. This trend is slightly different to the trend of over-consuming makeup because skincare is much more personal than makeup. You know, everyone's skin will react differently to the same product. So when you're determining a skincare routine, it's really important to find what works for your skin. You can't just see what works for someone else on TikTok and then replicate it and get the same results. With makeup, it's less so. You know, there's definitely still an element of finding a consistency that works for you in terms of like your base products. But with eyeshadow especially, Makeup is less personal because its purpose is not to make changes to your skin. It's just supposed to sit on top of your skin and then be wiped away at the end of the day. So an eyeshadow palette is gonna perform basically the same regardless of who's using it. And for that reason, I don't really like how people are encouraging their followers to do like 20 step skincare routines and buy tons of products because when it comes to skincare, you really need to figure out on your own what your skin needs before you go and buy stuff. Not everyone needs to use 20 products to get clear skin and not everyone will need to use the same products to get clear skin. Encouraging people to buy what you use will only result in products being wasted because they don't work for others the same way that they work for you. So people will stop using them when they don't get those results. And skincare is also the same as makeup in the terms of expiry. So massive skincare collections that we are seeing is buying into the same problem of consumerism that we saw five years ago in makeup because those huge collections will not necessarily get used up before they expire. We are seeing a lot of beauty gurus now making decluttering videos where they are throwing away their huge collections of makeup that are either expired or they don't use. And it appears from these videos that a lot of beauty gurus are sick of over consuming makeup and are actively trying to cut down on the amount of products that they have in their collections. I imagine this is quite difficult when they are still receiving a ton of PR from brands and they have to constantly go through it deciding either to keep it or give it away, but if I'm honest, I would much rather have that problem than have the problem of not being able to detach myself from a five year old blush and highlight duo that is most definitely expired but I just can't bring myself to throw it away. And whilst I'm glad to see that beauty gurus have moved away from advocating for overbuying tons of makeup, I doubt that I don't doubt that in a year or two we're going to see tons of skincare declutter videos when people find a new thing to excessively purchase, which is frustrating because obviously buying this amount of product only to throw it away in a couple of years without really using it is such an unnecessary waste. But the internet has always notoriously encouraged bigger and better rather than minimalism. So having these huge skincare routines is going to create more content for you and get you more views and more followers than having a small routine that you just show once. I don't know if the trend of being clean will really have enough of a counter effect to really make any difference to the overconsumption that the internet encourages but I hope now that people are more wary about being sustainable that this slow death of consumerism in the makeup industry will start to seep into other areas as well. My final point on this is that I think with makeup consumerism has definitely slowed down because everything's been done already. There is no need to buy a ton of new eyeshadow palettes because pretty palettes are coming out with great st colour stories every single day and it's difficult for a brand to be original when so many makeup products have already flooded the market in recent years. Like the 2010s was a great time for cosmetics because the 90s and the 2000s had been all about either neutral or smoky eye looks but then along came the 2010s and Instagram makeup took over which was bright, bold, colourful and it became all the rage and as a result, brands started to bring out more exciting palettes in bold colours that we hadn't really seen up to that point. Like the Jeffree Star, Blood Sugar, Blue Blood, Blood Money, etc. for example, they were a smash hit because no big brands at that point had made those monochrome themed palettes in those colours. So people loved it. I think Colourpop had maybe done blue before they did blue, but 
they were kind of the only one to be doing those monochromatic palettes before Jeffree Star came and did them. So getting your hands on an all blue palette or an all red palette was really quite difficult before he did that. And then the trend started where everyone was making these really colorful palettes. Huda Beauty's, you know, rose gold palette, that was a cultural reset, as was the Anastasia Beverly Hills Modern Renaissance, because they were giving people the deep pinks and golds that they hadn't been able to get from the big brands before because they'd been focusing entirely on like brown. And the problem is now it's very difficult for a brand to make a product that is revolutionary. It does sometimes happen that like a particular product does well and goes viral. So for example, the KVD Beauty Good Apple Foundation. However, it's not the same as seven years ago where every eyeshadow palette had an original color story that made people want to buy it. People just aren't as excited about makeup anymore, I feel. And I put that down to there being very few original ideas left to make. We've seen every variety of eyeshadow palette in so many shapes, sizes, gimmicks and colours. So what can a brand realistically offer now that would encourage people to overbuy their products? And because of this, the concept of collecting makeup is also dying quickly because there aren't any brands creating things that people are desperate to collect in the same way that they were with Kylie's lip kits or the Too Faced holiday collections, which I would put down partly to the fact that there are just so many brands now, particularly so many influencer brands that no one wants to commit to buying everything from one brand when there are so many to choose from and partly because no brands are making products that are so good that you'd want to collect every single one of them. And the lip kits were genius because they were the first of their kind. So that's why people wanted to get them all because you couldn't get them from anywhere else at that point. But makeup has progressed so far in the last 10 years that it's hard to really think of what a brand could do to make itself a collectible brand anymore. Honestly, I think overall people are just much more careful about their spending you know they don't buy into things just because of influencers anymore they aren't being drawn into the hype around a particular brand name because no brands are coming up and becoming the kind of top dogs the same way that like Kylie Cosmetics, Urban Decay, Jeffree Star Cosmetics had been at their respective peaks so we just aren't seeing people going crazy over specific brands anymore you know there are so many brands making good products that there aren't any that are particularly standing out worldwide. You know, at the time when Kylie Cosmetics came out, everyone was talking about it. You know, there was a point before everyone decided that Jeffree Star was a horrible person that people were all raving about Jeffree Star Cosmetics. So we just aren't seeing brands that are doing something that's either good enough or original enough to stand out over all of the other good brands. However, this is very much my opinion and I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on how makeup consumerism has changed, you know, do you still buy as much makeup as ever? You know, I'm finding I'm buying less makeup, I think that's just because I'm lazy and I can't bother to go to Boots and replace the makeup that I have. But also like the eyeshadow palettes that I have, I feel like they serve every need that I could possibly want. So unless I see something and I'm like, oh my god, I need it, I'm probably not going to buy any more eyeshadow palettes. And I don't know about you, but I find I'm less excited to see what a brand new launch is. Like, Kylie is still trying to tease her launches before they come out, but I just don't think that I would be sat around waiting for her to reveal it, even if the launch video was interesting. You know, is that the same for you guys? Are you still excited by new product launches? Have you found yourself being drawn into buying more skincare as a result of online trends or buying less makeup? If you have any thoughts at all, then feel free to leave them in the comments down below. Uh, leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it and don't forget to subscribe with notifications on. I will leave a couple of my recent videos down in the description if you want to watch any of those, but apart from that, I will hopefully see you guys in my next one. Bye guys!